Thank you, and let me say in advance that I've enjoyed, I've both enjoyed composing these lectures and giving them, and uh, several of, even though nobody asked questions after the last one, well, um, you have an occasion to ask questions that have helped me rethink passages in it. So um, if, you compare what I, if you compare what I said, I mean, why would you want to but anyway? Compare what I said now and what will eventually appear, you will see some changes due to you people. The understanding of God implicit in the Eucharist. <clears throat> in my second lecture, I argued that Christian liturgy as a whole is for the worship of God. God being implicitly understood as worthy of our awe, reverence, and love on account of his unsurpassable greatness and excellence. Then in my third lecture, I went on to note that the two types of actions most pervasive in the liturgy are actions of the people addressing God and actions of the people listening to what is said to them. In the lecture preceding this one, just two hours ago, I argued that some of the latter actions, listening, are to be understood as the people listening to what God is saying to them by way of what the human being says. What the human being says counts as God saying something. So the enactment of the liturgy is the site of mutual discourse between God and the people, with both parties functioning as speakers and listeners. The astoundingly bold and I would say paradoxical understanding of God implicit in the Christian liturgy is that the God of unsurpassable greatness and excellence bows down to listen, to hear, and to speak to us. Though speaking and listening are prominent and pervasive in, the Christ, in Christian liturgical worship, we must definitely resist the temptation to think of them as constituting the totality of liturgical actions. In the liturgy, we sing, we close our eyes, we fold our hands, we raise our hands, we kneel, we bow, we stand, we process, we are sprinkled with water, we are immersed in water, we pass the peace to each other, we deposit money in baskets, we light candles, we eat bread, drink wine. In some liturgical traditions, we spit. Some of these actions can be interpreted as actions whereby we perform speech actions, that is, elocutionary actions. But I judge that not all of them can plausibly be so interpreted. All of them are, however, as I see it, expressions or manifestations of worship. I want now to develop this point that liturgical actions go beyond speech actions by looking at the understanding of God implicit in one of the high points of the liturgy, if not indeed the high point, namely in our enactment of the Eucharist, or as it is often called by Protestants, the Lord's Supper. Several times over in talking about the construction of liturgical theology, I've made the point that we must not assume that discerning what's going on in some liturgical action is easy and straightforward, something that most of us can agree on, and that the hard and controversial work begins when we try to make explicit the understanding of God implicit in that action, and then to articulate that understanding theologically. And this is true especially for the Eucharist. Here especially we are confronted with alternative and controversial understandings of what's going on. Theological controversy does not arise after we have analyzed what's going on in our enactment of the Eucharist. The analysis is itself shaped by controversial theological claims. Now obviously this is not the place to present the major alternative analyses of the Eucharist that have been developed over the centuries, and then to argue for one of them. That would require um, a three-volume book. What I shall do instead is select and present one analysis and elicit the understanding of God implicit in that. You will not be surprised to learn that the analysis I have chosen is John Calvin's. Though you may be surprised to learn what Calvin's analysis actually comes to. It's my judgment that probably more than any other major analysis of the Eucharist, Calvin's analysis has been afflicted by stereotype descriptions that obscure what he actually thought and wrote. 
All traditional Eucharistic liturgies begin with a narrative of what God has done, set within the context of a prayer of praise and thanksgiving. Hence the term Eucharist from the Greek for thanksgiving, Eucharistia. In all of them, this narrative of praise and thanksgiving reaches its climax with a report of what Jesus said over the bread and the wine at his last supper with his disciples. Slightly different words being used, in, but only slightly, in different liturgies to express what Jesus said. All of them taken from the slightly different versions to be found in the three synoptic gospels and in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Here is how Paul reports what Jesus did and said, it being the consensus of scholars that this is the earliest report we have. Mm -hmm. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Here's how the Book of Common Prayer, right too, reports what Jesus did and said. It's an adaptation of Paul and the synoptics. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After, cup, after supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. And here is how the Orthodox liturgy reports what Jesus did and said. The night he was handed over, or rather surrendered himself for the life of the world, I think it's really interesting that that parenthetical insertion occurs. The night he was handed over, or rather surrendered himself for the life of the world, he took bread in his pure, holy, and blameless hands, and having given thanks, he blessed it, consecrated it, broke it, and offered it to his disciples and apostles, saying, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you for the remission of sins. Likewise, after supper, he offered the cup, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. That's the Orthodox uh, liturgy. Paul reports Jesus as saying, over both the bread and the wine, that his disciples are to do this as a memorial, I son of Nason, of him. Uh, gets translated in the translations that I've used here as remembrance. They are to reenact our Lord's last meal as a memorial of him. The Episcopal liturgy picks up this reference to memorial action, as do all other traditional liturgies with, for reasons that are obscure to me, the exception of the Orthodox. We enact the Eucharist as a memorial of Jesus. So a full, and adequate, a full and adequate analysis of the Eucharist requires, as one of its salient components, that the Eucharist is a memorial meal. And since doing something as a memorial is neither speaking nor listening, we would advance our discussion if we explored this aspect of the Eucharist and made explicit the understanding of God implicit therein. Calvin does not, however, make a big point of this memorial aspect of the Eucharist. It's not central to his analysis. He mentions it, but... Uh, so on this occasion, I propose saying nothing more about this dimension and focusing instead on matters central to Calvin's analysis. On another occasion, I have talked about as a memorial. Paul reports Jesus as saying over the bread, this is my body that is for you. Paul does not report Jesus as using the for you locution over the wine. Matthew and Mark report Jesus as using the for you locution over the wine, but not over the bread. Luke reports Jesus as using the for you locution over both the bread and the wine. The traditional liturgies all use some version of the for you locution over both the bread and the wine. 
Now the relevance of this point for my purposes here is the following. Most traditional interpretations of the Eucharist treat the words attributed to Jesus as if there were a full stop after this is my body and another full stop after this is my blood. This interpretation has, in my judgment, contributed to generating the controversies over real presence, transubstantiation, and the like. On Calvin's interpretation, the full stops come after for you. This is my body for you. This is my blood for you. And this interpretation is pivotal, I would say, for Calvin's entire analysis of the Eucharist. He says in one place, quote, the very powerful and almost entire force of the sacrament lies in these words, which is given for you, which is shed for you. Equally important for Calvin's interpretation is the fact that Jesus did not just declare that his body and blood are for you, referring in the first instance to his disciples, but that he invited him, as we all know, to take, eat, and drink. And that the disciples did, in fact, take, eat, and drink. I quote Calvin's compact paraphrase of Christ's words. Take, eat, drink. This is my body which is given for you. This is my blood which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. So I would say that we exaggerate only slightly if we say that Calvin's entire analysis of the Eucharist is shaped by these initial interpretations and emphases, along, indeed, with his acceptance of the traditional definition of a sacrament as effecting what it signifies. Having reported the words spoken by Jesus over the bread and the wine at his last meal with his disciples, the priest or minister then offers the bread to the congregants with some such words as the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, and offers the wine with some such words as the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The congregants then eat the bread and drink the wine. For Calvin, the central signifying phenomena in the Eucharist are these actions, not the bread and the wine as such, but the presider's actions of offering bread and wine to the congregants, and the congregants' actions of receiving and ingesting the bread and wine. Calvin affirms that the bread signifies, he'll use other words, represents, stands for Christ's body, and that the wine signifies, represents, stands for Christ's blood. But as he sees that the bread and wine don't possess their signifying functions independently, they possess them within the context of the signifying function of the presider's actions of offering bread and offering wine and the signifying function of the congregants' actions of eating the bread and drinking the wine. <clears throat> now, if the basic signifying phenomena in the Eucharist are the presider's actions of offering bread and wine, and the congregants' actions of eating the bread and drinking the wine, then what is basically signified must likewise be actions. So what are those signified actions? Given what he has said thus far, it's hard to see that Calvin could say anything other than what he does say. The presider's actions of offering bread and wine to the recipients signifies, represents, Christ offering them his body and blood, and their receiving and ingesting the bread and wine signifies, represents, their partaking of Christ's body and blood. Now recall that Calvin follows the tradition in understanding a sacrament as effecting what is signified. He says in one place, God accomplishes within what the minister represents and attests by outward action. Thus, the presider's actions of offering bread and wine do not merely signify for our understanding and imagination, says Calvin, that, God is, that Christ has offered his body and blood for us. By way of the presider's offering of bread and wine to the congregants, Christ now does, in fact, offer his body and blood to them. Quote, our Lord gives us in the supper what he signifies by it, 
and thus we really receive the body and blood of Christ. So to the congregants actions of eating the bread and drinking the wine do not merely signify that they accept Christ's offer and that they partake of his body and blood. Their acceptance and their partaking is thereby effectuated. There are some, says Calvin, who define the eating of Christ's flesh and the drinking of his blood as, in one word, nothing but to believe in Christ. Calvin disagrees. He says, it seems to me that Christ meant to teach something more definite and more elevated in that noble discourse in which he commands to us the eating of his flesh. It is that we are, so not just faith, it is that we are quickened by the, by the true partaking of him. And he has therefore designated this partaking by the words eating and drinking. In order that nobody should think that the life that we, we receive from him is received by mere faith and knowledge. As it is not the seeing, but the eating of bread that suffices to feed the body, so the soul must truly and deeply become partaker of Christ, that it may be quickened to spiritual life by his power. Though it's not a condition of Christ's offering his body and blood to someone in the sacrament that that person have faith, it is a condition of her genuinely partaking of Christ's body and blood that she have faith. In several of the preceding lectures in this series, including the one just preceding, I've employed the idea of one act counting as another, not causing another, but counting as another. One can assert that it's human today by assertively uttering the English sentence, it's human today. When one does so, one's act of asserting the English sentence counts as one's act of asserting that it's human today. And in our discussion of God's speaking in the preceding lecture, I called attention to the phenomenon of double agency discourse. Sometimes one person says something by way of another person speaking on his behalf. In such a case, what the former person says counts as the latter person saying something. What I did not take note of in my preceding lectures is that this phenomenon of one act counting as another is not limited to speaking. An example of the point is here, this, turning one's back on someone may count as insulting that person. Neither did I take note of the fact that double agency discourse is just one species of double, double agency action in general. My lawyer signing his name on a sheet of paper may count as my buying a house. The relevance is this. I suggest that this general action of one act counting as another, general concept, and the general concept of double agency action are helpful in formulating Calvin's analysis of the Eucharistic actions. The presider's actions of offering the bread and wine to the congregants count as Christ's offering to them his body and blood for their partaking. The presider's actions do not merely symbolize Christ's offering of his body and blood, nor do they merely provide the occasion for Christ's offering. Neither are they the means of Christ's offering, if one thinks of means in terms of causation. I think Calvin means to say that the presider's actions count as Christ's offering his body and blood for our partaking. And so too, our actions of taking the bread and eating it and taking the wine and drinking it, count as our accepting Christ's offer to partake of him. That's how we accept the offer. I observe that for Calvin, the central signifying phenomena in the Eucharist are not the bread and wine as such, but the presider's actions of offering bread and wine to the congregants and their actions of taking, eating, and drinking. Within the context of those signifying actions, the bread and the wine do, however, play an indispensable role. And not only do they play an indispensable role, though for Calvin it is of fundamental importance to note and keep in mind that the full sentences Jesus uttered were, this is my body for you, 
and this is my blood for you, that for Calvin is of crucial importance. It remains the case that Jesus did say, referring to the bread, this is my body, and that he did say, referring to the wine, this is my blood. So here's the question that this suggests. What is the force of the is in those two sentences? And more generally, what is the role of the bread and the wine in the Eucharistic actions? The repetition by the presider of Jesus' words have traditionally been understood as words of consecration. The presider consecrates this ordinary bread and this ordinary wine to this special sacramental use. And traditional Catholicism has held that on the occasion of the presider uttering these words of consecration, God substantiates the bread into Christ's body and the wine into Christ's blood. So that though it appears to be bread that the congregants are eating, it is not bread. And though it appears to be wine that they are drinking, it is not wine. Calvin's view is that the bread signifies or stands for Christ's body and that the wine signifies or stands for his blood. And in support of this interpretation, he quotes a large number of scriptural passages in which the copula is, does not express identity, but functions as a synonym of signifies. On this interpretation, on Calvin's interpretation, the presider's enunciation of the words of consecration are to be understood, in effect, as assigning signification to the bread and the wine. Let this bread stand for Christ's body. Let this wine stand for Christ's blood. Whereupon, when the presider offers the consecrated bread to the congregants, the bread does stand for Christ's body. And the presider's offering of the bread counts as Christ's offering his body. And when the presider offers the consecrated wine to the congregants, the wine now stands for Christ's blood, and the presider's offering the wine counts as Christ's offering his blood. Calvin offers what seems to me an interesting argument against interpreting the is in Christ's words, this is my body, this is uh, my blood, as the is of identity, apart from assembling a variety of scriptural passages in which is clearly means signifies. Recall that Calvin accepts the traditional understanding of a sacrament as effecting what is signified. Now, if the bread is transubstantiated into the body of Christ and the wine into his blood, then there is no longer any bread and there is no longer any wine. And if there is no longer any bread or wine, says Calvin, then there is no longer anything that signifies. So the doctrine of transubstantiation, Calvin argues, is incompatible with the traditional understanding of a sacrament as effecting what is signified. It's true that what is claimed to be the body of Christ appears to be bread, and what is claimed to be the blood of Christ appears to be wine, but these are only appearances. There is no bread and there is no wine, and hence no signifiers. Now let me quote. Christ's purpose was to, witness by the, was to witness by the outward symbol that his flesh is food. If he had put forward only the empty appearance of bread and not true bread, where would be the analogy or comparison needed to lead us from the visible thing to the invisible? The nature of the sacrament is therefore canceled unless, in the mode of signifying, the earthly sign corresponds to the heavenly king. <laughs> thing. The word corresponds in that last sentence that I just read leads to an important additional point concerning Calvin's analysis. Often when we assign one thing to signify or stand for another, let, let that chair stand for so-and-so and let that chair stand for so-and-so. Often when we assign one thing to signify or stand for another, our assignment is arbitrary or very nearly so. We could just as well have assigned the signifying function to a large number of other things. 
Calvin rejects the idea that it is purely arbitrary that bread is a sign to stand for Christ's body and that wine is a sign to stand for his blood. Incidentally, a soup, I think a very good analysis of Calvin on the Eucharist is by the Catholic writer Killian MacDonald. MacDonald interprets Calvin as, as saying that what signifies what in the sacrament is arbitrary. Uh, definitely not. In the context of defending his interpretation of the meaning of the copula in Christ's declaration, Calvin says this, for though the symbol differs in essence from the thing signified, in that the latter is spiritual and heavenly while the former is physical and visible, still it does not symbolize the thing that is, still it does not symbolize the thing that it has been consecrated to represent as a bare and empty token, but also truly exhibits it. He enlists Augustine in support. If sacraments did not have a certain likeness to those things of which they are sacraments, they would not be sacraments at all. Moreover, from this likeness, they often also take the names of the things themselves. And Calvin says this, let it therefore remain certain that in the supper, the flesh of Christ is not truly and fittingly promised to us to be truly food, unless the true substance of the outward symbol corresponds. So there has to be a correspondence. It has to show, display, whatever. Well, the central questions posed by Calvin's analysis of the Eucharist are quite obviously, what is it to partake of Christ's body and blood? And correspondingly, what is it for Christ to offer us his body and blood for our partaking? When Calvin attempts to say what it is to partake of Christ's body and blood, he does not apply some independently arrived at theory of partaking or participation. Instead, he is guided in his reflections by the thesis that we've just seen, that it is by no means arbitrary that eating bread and drinking wine would be used to signify partaking of Christ's body and blood. The signifying action, to say it again, depicts pictures the signified action. Accordingly, what Calvin does is this. Rather than an abstract discourse on participation or partaking, he first reflects on the function in our lives of eating bread and drinking wine, and he then employs what he calls the analogy of the sign to understand what it is to partake of Christ's body and blood. You could put it like this, he uses eating bread and drinking wine as a model for understanding partaking of Christ's body and blood. Quote, our souls are fed by the flesh and blood of Christ in the same way that bread and wine keep and sustain physical life. Or to put the same idea in yet other words, we can employ just as so also reasoning to gain some understanding of what it is to partake of Christ's body and blood. Quote, by partaking of him, his life passes into us and is made ours, just as bread, when taken as food, imparts vigor to the body. And now I'm going to quote a more uh, lengthy passage. From the physical things set forth in the sacrament, we are led by a sort of analogy to spiritual things. Thus, when bread is given as a symbol of Christ's body, we must at once grasp this comparison. As bread nourishes, so here we get another example of just as so also reasoning. As bread nourishes, sustains, and keeps the life of our body, so also Christ's body is the only food to invigorate and enliven our soul. When we see wine set forth as a symbol of blood, we must reflect on the benefits which wine imparts to the body, and so realize that the same are spiritually imparted to us by Christ's blood. These benefits are to nourish, refresh, strengthen, and gladden. For if we sufficiently consider what value we have received from the giving of that most holy body and the shedding of that blood, we shall clearly perceive that those qualities of bread and wine are, according to such analogy, excellently adapted 
to express those things when they are communicated to us. So to understand partaking, we should reflect on eating bread and drinking wine. In this passage, Calvin speaks of the benefits of drinking wine, thereby implicitly distinguishing between partaking of drinking wine and the benefits of so doing. He correspondingly speaks of the benefits of partaking of Christ's blood, thereby implicitly drawing a contrast between partaking of Christ's blood and the benefits of so doing. He employs the same distinction, partaking, benefits, and other passages. This strongly suggests the following. To partake of Christ, as Calvin understands it, is to take Christ into oneself. By eating the bread and drinking the wine, we take Christ into ourselves. That's what it is to partake of Christ. It's to take him, receive him into oneself. Having received or taken Christ, Christ then, Christ then dwells and works within us. These are the benefits for our justification, sanctification, and glorification. Here's one of several passages in which Calvin describes the benefits of our having taken Christ into ourselves. The benefits consisting of the result of Christ now dwelling and working within us. The passage revels in paradox. Quote, this is the wonderful exchange which out of his measureless benevolence he has made with us. That becoming, becoming son of man with us, he has made us sons of God with him. That by his descent to earth, he has prepared an ascent to heaven for us. That by taking on our mortality, he has conferred his immortality upon us. That accepting our weakness, he has strengthened us by his power. That receiving our poverty unto himself, he has transferred his wealth to us. That taking the weight of our iniquity upon himself, he has clothed us with righteousness. So, to pull this together, God does not do an end run around our actions. God employs our liturgical actions for our sanctification. And that is strange and paradoxical that God would employ our own actions for our sanctification. <laughs> Now it is fairly often said that union with Christ is the heart of Calvin's theology of the Eucharist. Though that's not false, it is incomplete and I think misleading. Calvin does sometimes say that upon a person of faith eating the bread and drinking the wine of the sacrament, he or she is united with Christ. But far more often he says that he or she partakes of the body and blood of Christ. Reference to partaking, but also reference to Christ's body and blood for which the bread and the wine stand is, are indispensable for Calvin. There are some, he says, who hold that communion with Christ consists of, quote, being partakers of the spirit only, admitting, omitting mention of flesh and blood. Calvin rejects that. So let me explain. A fundamental component of Calvin's Christology and a fundamental presupposition of his theology of the Eucharist is that the ascended Christ retains human nature, more specifically retains a human body, glorified but still human. The ascension did not mean that Jesus Christ disappeared and that what remained was just the second person of the Trinity. Christ, says Calvin, did not put off the flesh. The ascended Christ remains Jesus Christ. It was to keep that before us, to keep before us that it is of the flesh and blood Jesus Christ that we partake, that Calvin almost always speaks of partaking of the flesh and blood of Christ, seldom just of Christ. Quote, uh, no, the flesh, the, the, the phrase, the flesh and blood of Christ is to be understood as a synecdoche for the, for the flesh and blood Jesus Christ. It is of the once and still embodied Jesus Christ 
that we partake. Calvin has an additional reason for insisting on speaking of partaking of the flesh and blood of Christ. Many of the actions that Christ performs for us and within us are benefits brought about by the shedding of his blood, by the shedding of his blood and by his bodily death. So, quote, if the reason for communicating with Jesus Christ is in order that we have part and portion in all the gifts that he has procured for, for us by his death, it, it is not only a matter of being partakers of his spirit, it is necessary also to partake of his humanity, in which he rendered complete obedience to God his Father to satisfy our debts. Though rightly speaking, the one cannot be without the other, that is the spirit without the body. For when he gives himself to us, it is in order that we possess himself entirely, flesh and blood, uh, spirit and flesh. Well, though Calvin says a good deal more about the Eucharist than what I have thus far presented, what I have presented is the core of his analysis. The other points he makes either flesh out the analysis or take note of what are, for him, other more peripheral dimensions of the Eucharistic actions. But before we move on to discuss the understanding of God implicit in the core of his analysis, I think we should take note of a point of which Calvin makes a good deal, though it's not central to his analysis, and a point that became prominent in what the Reformed Confessions say about the Eucharist. Calvin holds that by the presider's action of offering the congregants bread and wine, Christ seals, he'll use synonyms, confirms, ratifies, Christ seals that he really is offering himself to us for our partaking. Quote, that sacred partaking of his flesh and blood by which Christ pours his life into us as if it penetrated into our bones and marrow like bread and wine. He also testifies and seals in the supper, not by presenting a vain and empty sign, but by manifesting there the effectiveness of his spirit to fulfill what he promises. I think that to fully understand what he has in mind here, we have to bring into the picture his understanding of the ways in which the Eucharist both resembles and differs from scripture and sermon. The Eucharist is like scripture and sermon in that, to put it very generally, in both of them, Christ is presented to us. Let it be regarded as a settled principle that the sacraments have the same office as the word of God to offer and set forth Christ to us and in him the treasures of heavenly grace. What's different about the sacraments is that rather than employing conventional linguistic terms to offer and set forth Christ to us, they set before our eyes what they signify. They pictorially represent what they signify. The sacramental symbol, Calvin's words, truly exhibits what it symbols, symbolizes. Another quote, by the showing of the symbol, the thing itself is shown. And what is shown is that it is Christ himself who offers himself to us and that he does not offer himself in some general way, but offers himself for our partaking of him. Now for us human beings, says Calvin, embodied creatures and often weak in faith, this picturing serves the function of making it more evident to us that Christ is indeed offering himself and making it more evident and making more evident to us the nature of Christ's offering. It speaks, as Calvin, both to our dullness of mind and to our weakness of faith, this picturing function. Quote, as our faith is slight and feeble unless it be propped up on all sides and sustained by every means, it trembles, wavers, totters, and at last gives way. Here our merciful Lord, according to his infinite kindness, so tempers himself to our capacity that since we are creatures who always creep on the ground, cleave to the flesh, I do not think about or even conceive of very much spiritual. He condescends to lead us to himself, even by these earthly elements, and to set before us in the flesh a mirror of spiritual blessings. And again, the clearer anything is, the fitter it is to support faith. 
But the sacraments bring the clearest promises. And they have this characteristic over and above the word. This is still Calvin. Over and above the word. Because they represent them for us as painted in a picture from life. Now upon encountering Calvin's idea that by way of the presiders offering bread and wine to the congregants, Christ confirms and seals to them that he is indeed offering himself to them for their partaking. One initially thinks, I say one initially thinks, I initially thought that this confirming or sealing action of Christ is an action in addition to his offering himself for our partaking. But I think closer reading of the passages makes clear that that's not how Calvin was thinking. The presider's actions do not count as two actions on Christ's part, offering himself for our partaking and sealing that he's doing so indeed. Rather than being a separate action, sealing is, as it were, an adverbial modifier of the action of offering. By virtue of the pictorial nature and function of the actions performed by the presider, Christ offers himself to us for our partaking in a sealing or confirming way. In the preceding lecture on God speaking, I mentioned that in this subsequent lecture, I would be making an addition to what I said there. There I argued that on Calvin's understanding of what takes place in the reading of scripture and the preaching of the sermon, God speaks to us here and now by way of the reading and the preaching. The reading and the preaching count as God saying something to us here and now. And I endorse this Calvinistic interpretation of these liturgical actions. But from Calvin's analysis of the Eucharist, Coupled with his analysis, comparison of the Eucharist with scripture reading and preaching, it becomes clear that Calvin holds that something more takes place in scripture reading and preaching than that by way of these actions, God here and now says something to us in the form of promise and command. The more that happens is that Christ actually offers himself to us. Doesn't merely speak, but offers. And Calvin's doctrine is that Christ does so in the Eucharist as well. Christ's offering of himself in the Eucharist is different, however, that it is accomplished in this confirmatory sealing manner or mode. In the Reformed tradition, it is rather often, often said that preaching and the Eucharist are both modes of proclamation. The proclamation being verbal in preaching and pictorial in the Eucharist. And Bart, in fact, follows in that Reformed tradition. If Calvin had said nothing more about the Eucharist than that here God signs and seals his promises, that would, I judge, be a pretty plausible interpretation of his view. But it should be clear by now that it was far from being Calvin's view that the Eucharist is simply an alternative pictorial mode of proclamation. In the Eucharist, Christ offers himself for our partaking, and that is not to be identified with proclaiming Jesus Christ. But something else happens in the, happens in the Eucharist at, as well that makes it dis, decisively different from the sermon. For Calvin, the Eucharist is not completed by Christ offering himself to us for our partaking. It is completed only when we partake of Christ, when we take Christ into ourselves by eating the bread and drinking the wine. Whereupon, by the power of the Spirit, Christ then dwells and works within us for our justification, sanctification, and glorification. Our ingesting the bread and wine makes it clear that our reception of Christ's offer is not a matter merely of believing. To repeat a passage quoted above, the life we receive from Christ is not received by mere knowledge, as it is not the seeing, but the eating of bread that suffices to feed the body so the soul must truly and deeply become partaker of Christ, so that it may be quickened to spiritual life by his power. Calvin's teaching concerning partaking of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist reminds one, once again reminds me anyway, of the doctrine of divinization, theosis, that is common in Eastern Orthodoxy. Formulations of the doctrine vary somewhat. Some theologians say that divinization consists of becoming God. 
Others say that it consists of becoming like God. Yet others say that it consists of partaking of the divine nature. A sentence from the ancient church father Irenaeus is commonly quoted. If the word has been made man, it is so that men may be made gods. An especially striking statement of this last version of the doctrine is to be found in an unexpected place, namely C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Here's what Lewis says. The command, be ye perfect, is not idealistic gas, nor is it a command to do the impossible. God is going to make us into creatures that can obey that command. He said in the Bible that we were gods, and he's going to make good his words. If we let him, for we can prevent him if we choose, if we let him, he will make the feeblest and filthiest of us into a god or a goddess, a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine, a bright, stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly, though, of course, on a smaller scale his own boundless power and delight and goodness. The process will be long and in parts very painful, but that's what we're in for, nothing less. He meant what he said. Though Calvin's teaching, I think, unmistakably resembles the various formulations of the doctrine of theosis or divinization, it differs from most of them in his insistence that it is not of the divine nature we partake in the Eucharist, but of the once and still embodied Jesus Christ. In our discussion of the Eucharist thus far, we have been engaged in the, what I regard as the first stage in the formation of liturgical theology, the stage in which we analyze what's going on in some part of the liturgy. But here is elsewhere our analysis has unavoidably overlapped with the second stage, that in which we make explicit the understanding of God implicit in that part of the liturgy. Much of the understanding of God implicit in the Eucharist on Calvin's analysis has already been made explicit. So what I will mainly do in the remainder of this lecture is highlight some of what we've learned and look at it from a few different angles. Before doing so, however, I should say once again that I realize full well that the analysis of the Eucharist that I have presented, namely Calvin's analysis, is controversial. Some will prefer a traditional Catholic analysis, according to which the high point is the consecration of the elements rather than the offering and the ingesting of bread and wine. A good many Protestants will prefer a Zwinglian anal analysis, according to which the Eucharist is nothing more, though also nothing less, than a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving on our part. But this is not the occasion to defend, defend Calvin's analysis against these and other alternatives. And of course, there will be yet others who themselves have no particular view as to what transpires in the Eucharist, but find it impossible to give credence to Calvin's high view of what happens. I have argued that we who are Christians enact our liturgy to worship God, not to appease God, not to placate God, not to center ourselves, but to worship God. The stance that pervades the enactment of the entire liturgy is awed reverential adoration of God. The understanding of God implicit in such worship being that God is, is of unsurpassable glory, holiness, and love. As we have seen, one type of action pervasive in Christian liturgy is the people addressing God in praise, thanksgiving, blessing, intercession, and so forth. The understanding of God implicit in such actions being that God listens to and hears what we say in our address to him. As we have also seen, another type of action prominent in the liturgy is that of a human being speaking on behalf of God. The understanding of God implicit in such double agency discourse being that God speaks to us here and now. At various points in my discussion, I have called attention to the paradoxical and astoundingly bold quality of understanding God in these ways. To claim that the God of unsurpassable greatness and excellence would, in the course of our enactment of the liturgy, stoop down to listen to what we say to him, to hear and to speak to us. This is not only astoundingly bold, but paradoxical. 
Worship of God need not take the form of mutual communication between God and God's people. But in the case of the Christian liturgy and the Jewish, it does. A point that I have not previously made is that mutual communication, when conducted in a, conducted in a spirit of mutual love, is a form of communion between persons. The enactment of the Christian liturgy is distinctive and that here worship of God takes the form of communion between God and God's people. Communicative communion, one might call it. The implicit understanding of God, quite obviously, is that the creator and sustainer of the universe is willing to enter into communicative communion with us as human creatures. Indeed, that he is desirous of doing so. Note now that com the communion between God and the people that pervades the enactment of the liturgy attains its highest form in the Eucharist. By eating the bread and drinking the wine, we take Christ into ourselves, whereupon Christ lives and works within us. This is a form of communion that goes far beyond that which takes place in mutual communication in love. Indeed, so far as I can see, it has no close analog in human interactions. When we were discussing communicative communion between God and the people, we could point to close analogs on how we human beings relate to each other. And you could use those analogs to illuminate what takes place in the liturgy. The form of communion that takes place in the enactment of the Eucharist has no analog in how we human beings relate to each other. The analog bequeathed to us by Christ himself is that of ingesting bread and wine. The God who is of unsurpassable excellence does not only stoop down to listen to us, to hear us, and to speak to us. He stoops down to dwell and work within us in the person of Jesus Christ. In listening and speaking, there remains a certain distance between the interlocutors. In the communion that takes place in the Eucharist, all distance is removed. A different but related point is the following. Actions of addressing God are not as such Christological in character. Their content may, of course, be Christological. Often it is. But they are not Christological just by virtue of being instances of addressing God. By contrast, Eucharistic actions on Calvin's analysis are intrinsically Christological. Christ offers himself for our partaking, and we partake of Christ. The theology implicit in the Eucharist is intrinsically Christological. I've already taken note of one aspect of the Christology implicit in the Eucharist on Calvin's analysis, namely that the ascension of Christ did not represent the second person of the Trinity shucking off human nature with the consequence that Jesus Christ went out of existence. It is of Jesus Christ that we partake. Hence Calvin's insistence on saying that we partake of the flesh and blood of Christ. The aspect of Christology most prominent in Calvin's analysis, however, is that Christ does not just accomplish our salvation by his actions of incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, it then being up to us to grab hold by faith of what he has accomplished. What Calvin insists on adding is this, Christ dwells and works within us to perfect us. So the Christology implicit in the Eucharist on Calvin's analysis is a Christology that comes to expression in the Gospel of John and in certain of Paul's letters. Here is part of what Jesus says in one of his disputes with his antagonists. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. That's the Calvinistic note. Here is part of what Jesus says in his farewell discourse to his disciples. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, 
for apart from me you can do nothing. And here's what Paul says in his letter to the Romans. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of God within him does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although your bodies are dead because of sin, your spirits are alive because of doing what is right. On Calvin's analysis, in the Eucharist, we enact Johannine and Pauline Christology. I think it would be interesting and valuable to see in detail how a Christology that begins from what is implicit in the Eucharist would differ from traditional Christologies. I would guess that by virtue of beginning from Christ's present indwelling in believers, rather than from what happened in Bethlehem two millennia ago, it would be, by virtue of those different beginnings, it would be significantly different in its configuration. But only if someone actually develops a liturgical Christology can we be sure of that. So allow me a closing comment along a different line. I judge that liturgical theology poses a serious challenge to a good deal of traditional philosophical theology. Traditional philosophical theology begins by asking what God has to be like given the way the world is. And it adds to this that God is perfect, a being than which there can be none greater. It concludes, among a number of other things, that God is eternal, unconditioned, and immutable. By contrast, liturgical theology highlights the fact that God listens to what we say to him. It would seem that God's listening to what we say to God occurs when we say it. And if so, that would seem to conflict with the claim that God is eternal, outside of time. It would also seem to conflict with the claim that God is immutable. If God listens to what we say to him when we say it, that would seem to constitute a change in God. Just as there is a change in my life when I listen to what you say to me, or to what God says to me. And if listening to what we say to God does indeed constitute a change in God's life, then it would seem that we have to give up the doctrine of divine aseity or unconditionedness. God's listening to what we say to him has a condition outside of God himself, namely our saying something to God. Now these quick comments fall far short of establishing incompatibility between liturgical theology and the traditional philosophical doctrines of divine eternity, immutability, and aseity. To actually establish incompatibility, assuming it can be established, would require a lot of hard and careful philosophical and theological work. And if incompatibility can be established between these doctrines of philosophical theology and the theology that I have claimed to be implicit in the liturgy, it's always open to the philosophical theologian either to dismiss the liturgy as deeply misguided in what it assumes about God, or to follow in Maimonides' footsteps by arguing that the theology I've claimed to be implicit in the liturgy is not in fact implicit and offering an alternative Maimonides-style analysis of the liturgy, according to which there's no incompatibility between the conclusions of philosophical theology and what is implicit in the liturgy. All I wish to say at this point is that liturgical theology poses questions to traditional philosophical theology that, to the best of my knowledge, none of those who have written about philosophical theology have taken into account. And I include myself in that generalization. I now regard that as a serious shortcoming. Thanks.